The fundamental truth that many haven't yet grasped is that energy as a technology is quite different from energy as a commodity. This idea is the secret sauce of the future is electric worldview. The economics of electricity produced by clean energy technologies like wind and solar, then turned into work with EVs and heat pumps, are far superior to those of oil and gas extracted from the ground, then burned by internal combustion engines and furnaces and boilers. Energy as a technology is like electronics manufacturing. Continual innovation reduces costs while boosting performance. That means falling prices, higher efficiencies, simpler and more reliable products and systems. The process is well underway with clean energy technologies. Costs have fallen 50 to 90% thanks to learning curves. Performance, like the energy density of batteries, which grows 7% per year, has risen dramatically. Oil and gas simply cannot match this model. As soon as you get um, electronics infiltrating something, like we are now with batteries and, and solar in particular, the characteristics of competition and innovation change to look more like the underlying technology of the electronics that are in it. It is now being driven like it is a technology because the cost curves and performance curves are based on electronics rather than extraction and you know or reduction and things like that that, that the past system was about. It's a, it's a disruption of the underlying competition based on the technology of electronics. I, I just think it's super interesting to see, can we do it without fossil fuels, without CCS and without nuclear? And the answer is, well, you can debate whether it's going to be a little bit more expensive or a little bit less expensive and, and, and which situation is optimal or not or whatever. But you cannot debate that it's possible. And that is a really a big change from like 15 years ago when it was also when I started writing about this sort of stuff, it was also completely clear to me and to some people like Christian Breyer that it could be done. Uh, that sustainable energy system where we're... where where really easily possible, uh, even with, with current technology, uh, only needed learning curves to become uh, more cost-effective, but basically also very predictable, as Doyne Farmer has done great work in sort of predicting how these sort of learning curves uh, work. But it was still very, yeah, um, you were really doing things that were not done according to most people if you sort of sort of thought up these thought experiments with 100% wind and solar and now it's completely mainstream christian Breyer was cited in the last ipc report 35 times i think with with uh, with uh, 35 studies so 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 it's mainstream and it's strange that so many people don't know it yet and that oil and gas industry gets away with saying yeah but that stuff will never work we know better that's so outdated. China decided 20 years ago to dominate clean energy industry. Today, it leads the world by a wide margin, manufacturing up to 90% of the solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, electric transportation, heat pumps, and other electric technologies. Controlling the manufacturing also means controlling supply chains, including critical mineral supplies. China also leads the world in deployment of all those technologies while exporting them in ever greater numbers to rich countries, as well as the emerging economies OPEC hopes will stick with oil and gas. This dominance in manufacturing, deployment, and exports means China is now driving the transition from 20th century fossil fuels to 21st century energy technologies, making China the first electrostate. Uh, so if we think about the the supply chain, China was uh, China, China uh, produced about uh, or not produced. China refines and processing about uh, sixty percent of lithium and also about ninety percent of rare earth minerals also comes from China in terms of refined and many refinery refined pro, uh, refining and the process capacity. So from that perspective, I would say going back to your earlier point, it really is China's dominance across the entire supply chain combined 
combined with the fast speed of innovation. Uh, now, uh, the kind of over secure the uh, the bigger background of a, a, about a lot of this concern is that the over securitization of issues. The idea that China's innovation capacity and in particular the way that China acquires advanced technology may have the potential to empower the Chinese military. That is the bigger uh, concern from um, the, from America's military industrial complex. The re-emergence of industrial policy, led by China but now adopted by many other nations, is the real game changer for energy transition policy for three reasons. One, China's use of industrial policy to build a massive clean energy manufacturing sector is viewed by the United States as a geopolitical and national security threat. The U.S. and its allies are building their own solar panel, battery, and EV plants to avoid being vulnerable to Chinese supply chains. Two, government intervention in the economy is a key feature of industrial policy. This is a major change from the free market, low taxes, private sector focus of the past 40 years. Three, the U.S. now perceives the deindustrialization and shift to a services economy that started in the 1980s to be a mistake. Reindustrialization is the new buzzword in Washington and other national capitals. Climate policies like carbon pricing will continue to be a significant driver of the energy transition, but not as significant as industrial policy. Industrial policy in the academic world uh, just refers to any direct intervention by a government in order to boost a particular sector or to change the overall structure of an economy. Uh, in the policy world, we try to think about industrial policy in terms of these intentional cases of state support, ideally and usually a strategic state support for a particular sector. So it's industrial policy, which are these intentional efforts to build the technologies that we need for a net zero world or for a, a totally decarbonized economy. And when we're really talking about clean energy or net zero or green industrial policy, we're talking about efforts to build industry, actually build up the companies, the firms, the sets of workers that are needed in order to execute on the transition. And it's really important to note that the lens that is given to us by taking an industrial policy perspective is distinct from the lens of an emissions reduction framework, not at odds with or in any way uh, opposite to, but just distinct from the logic of an emissions reductions network uh, 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 effort. We're not trying to reduce the amount of emiss emissions through green industrial policy. We're trying to produce the technologies that will then reduce those emissions. China decided 20 years ago to dominate clean energy industry. Today, it leads the world by a wide margin, manufacturing up to 90% of the solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, electric transportation, heat pumps, and other electric technologies. Controlling the manufacturing also means controlling supply chains, including critical mineral supplies. China also leads the world in deployment of all those technologies while exporting them in ever greater numbers to rich countries, as well as the emerging economies OPEC hopes will stick with oil and gas. This dominance in manufacturing, deployment, and exports means China is now driving the transition from 20th century fossil fuels to 21st century energy technologies, making China the first electrostate. Up until very recently, what happened in China stayed in China. So it's sort of been off our radar screen. But just as you say, end of 2023, we start to see some gargantuan numbers coming out of China. And then you pause and you think, hang on, what... China's put together in terms of an auto industry is unlike anything we've seen in a hundred years. It's it's a massive, powerful machine. Just to give you a couple numbers. One is uh, China this year will produce 30 million vehicles. That's twice as many as we make in North America, twice as many. China will produce more EVs than all other countries in the world combined. China will export more than any other country, including Japan and Korea, to more than a hundred countries and the list goes on. China dominates the battery industry, the battery supply chain industry. And you think, if you're Carlos Tavares, you look around and you say, my goodness, we if we don't get our act together quickly, China could overwhelm our global auto industry just as it has already proven able to do in solar panels, in the shipping industry, in steel, and a number of other businesses. So 
The threat is real. Europe has been a global leader in green policy dating back to the 1970s and 1980s, led by Germany, the region's industrial powerhouse. The Energy Vinda project is the country's strategy to reach carbon neutrality by mid-century. While the European Union led the United States in clean energy policies and actions, Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine was the game changer. At the time, Russia supplied 40% of European gas and 16% of its oil. EU sanctions against Russia virtually ended those imports. A few months after hostilities began, the EU released Repower EU, a strategy to more rapidly shift to renewable energy, increase energy efficiency, and diversify oil and gas supplies in the short term. Thus far, the plan has worked remarkably well, though the EU is still not on track to meet its now very ambitious renewable energy targets. Introduction of the American Inflation Reduction Act has spurred Europe to be even more aggressive. It is hoped that a new Green Deal will prevent European manufacturers from leaving for the United States and the very generous Inflation Reduction Act incentives. While under pressure from both China and the US, Europe appears determined to keep pace in the new clean energy arms race. Despite being home to Tesla, the world's largest EV scale manufacturer, the United States clean energy pivot got off to a slow start, in part because its oil and gas sector is the world's largest. The COVID-19 pandemic changed everything. Washington realized in 2020 that disruptions to Chinese supply chains left its economy particularly vulnerable. Concerns about national security, military preparedness, and growing geopolitical conflict with China now trumped climate change. The American government passed the Infrastructure Act, the CHIPS Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act that will likely inject between one and two trillion taxpayer dollars into clean energy manufacturing by the early 2030s. Equally important is the private capital crowded in by subsidies. $52 billion of support for battery projects has leveraged over $800 billion of investment. Consequently, the U.S. is undergoing a clean energy boom. Wind and solar generation is rapidly growing. Power grids are being modernized. Battery plants and supply chains are sprouting around the country. Legacy automakers are having trouble pivoting to electric, and that will be a struggle to watch carefully over the next few years. The U.S. says it wants to wrench the clean energy lead from China. Time will tell if it succeeds. Prior to the pandemic, of course, you had Congress members who cared very deeply about the effects of climate change, uh, both in their communities and across the world at large, were thinking about ways in which we could mitigate that. And then, of course, the pandemic happened and the the topic of supply chains all of a sudden became a national topic and communities realized that we've spent a lot quite a lot of time offshoring jobs and capacities and as a result the united states was suffering and so it became a bipartisan issue whether or not we could actually reindustrialize and prior to that industrial strategy was not something that united states talked about of course it's something that china does very well that wasn't a conversation that was having in in the United States. And now, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, things are very different. We are a country that's trying to make things again. And of course, we used to be a country that used to make things. So it, it's 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 a very it's a very interesting 180 back to the kind of capacities we used to have. China currently has a very big lead in the global clean energy race. But think back to the adoption S curve we discussed in earlier slides. Clean energy technologies have only passed their inflection points a few years ago. Those technologies may or may not have reached maturity by 2050. There may be new energy technologies that arise to challenge them in global markets over the next decade or two. Which of the current competitors, China, the US, Europe, perhaps Japan and South Korea, might introduce those new technologies or stumble and fall? Or will new competitors race to the front? The Rocky Mountain Institute is right. The energy transition race is long, and the winner is far from determined. But one thing is clear at this point. 
the determination of the U.S. and the EU to catch China will ultimately make for a much closer race, creating intense competition that will drive the energy transition ever faster. So in the future, the uh, you've, got a, you've, got, you've got a big catch up going on right now. So, so basically, Putin invades Ukraine February 2022, and uh, the U- U.S. and Europe both look around them as they did, of course, famously in the 1970s. In the 1970s, the answer was nuclear. This time around, the answer um, was or is renewables. But then they realized that China was dominating the renewable supply chain. They better get their better get a grip and, and get their act together. So as a result, we will see a 16 fold increase in um, in supply chain capex in US and Europe, um, still far behind China for what it's worth. Um, but but nevertheless, a massive surge enabling these countries to start to compete, start to have their own supply chains, start to produce some of their own uh, goods. And, and I should also say um because people have kind of a few people have said to me, oh, well, it's game over. China's won. It's complete nonsense. I mean, as I say, 10 years ago, China hadn't won. And then put on a minute and they're winning. Um, oh. And there are actually lots of different areas where uh, the U.S. and Europe can lead. The U.S. National Science Board defines enabling technologies as discoveries arising from advanced science and engineering activity that allow the creation or improvement of products and services across a wide product scope end quote. Basically, innovations in one space support innovations in other spaces. Modern clean energy technologies would not be possible without many, many enabling technologies. The problem with describing the technologies that enable the electrification of everything is that there are so many, including advanced materials, artificial intelligence, and digital technologies. A key feature of this energy transition is the fast pace at which scientists and engineers can innovate and adapt enabling technologies. This gives nations with strong innovation ecosystems like China and the United States a competitive advantage. We're still living with the analog past that literally coming back from the 1880s right sort of you know one-way flow of information it's not smart it's not networked what have you but i think some of the key transition the the key enabling technologies that are going to allow us to really jump forward in terms of clean energy use and electrification and and frankly productivity gains across the economy uh, include digitization um, everything being slightly aware and being smart and can be controlled remotely and what have you uh, bat with the, the capacity to put batteries everywhere in the system. We can take our old, very dumb grid and make it smart by putting wireless and batteries all throughout it. We don't have to build a whole new grid. We just add to it. Um, and on top of that, you can lay in AI, which will allow us to kind of manage microgrids. Like we have this whole broad electricity grid across North America and around the world, obviously. But we, the AI can manage sub parts of it so that we we get micromanagement if we need a little bit more batteries, a little bit more supply. You can get it where it's needed. You don't have to make big, huge decisions like BC Hydro, Hydro has had to do. But actually, AI offers also an incredible opportunity. The amount, like the ability for us to predict the weather so much more accurately now, even on five years ago. And if you look at the trend of where AI is going, I can only get excited about where we're going to go in five years from now. How well we're going to be able to predict uh, weather forecasts and therefore how uh, when we can expect solar generation and wind generation to come in. This is more of a soft technology, a technology, uh, de- uh, a software technology development that I'm very excited about.